Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to the replay viewers. I'm Reverend Ruby Pollard from Reverend Ruby Ministries. And you can find me at my website. Continue in 2 Kings chapter 5. Um, I'm going to continue with the second half of that chapter. And this part is talking about Gehazi. But I'm going to go back a little bit um, and just reference the story that we studied about the Shunammite woman. Um, that's if you didn't see it, then then it's part of the Second King sort of series that I've been doing. Um, so I'm going to reference that a little bit, but I'll tell you the the scripture text. We're going to look at this story. We're going to see Gehazi's character be tested in this story, but I want all of us to know it's not just Gehazi's character that's going to be tested. Our character is going to be tested as well. But God doesn't, the word says, God doesn't tempt any man. God doesn't tempt humans, right, to sin. There's no sin in God. So God can never tempt us to sin. And so when we, you know, are drawn away and, and, and make bad judgments, well, stay tuned. I have some insight for you on this. Let us pray and get started. Father, we come in the name of Jesus thanking you for each person on the scope, each person that will watch by replay, oh God. I thank you for unveiling your word of truth to us. Holy Spirit, you are the spirit of all truth, oh God. Reveal your word unto us. Unveil your spirit and your word that is revealed in this passage, oh God. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. I thank you, Lord, for this time that your people have set aside to study your word with me. I ask a special blessing on them and their families. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we're in 2 Kings chapter 5, and I'm going to be reading from beginning at the 20th verse. We read uh, verses 1 through 20 yesterday, so if you missed that, it was just yesterday. It'd be easy to find. So this is about Gehazi, and the text starts off with a but. So remember on yesterday, it was, see Gehazi is sort of the armor bearer, the, the servant, um, the, the uh, man of God who stands by the prophet Elijah. And he's often sent, as we see in the text, as his messenger. So Elijah sometimes sends Gehazi with a message. Right. So so he moves as the prophet speaks and he may move on his behalf and at his instruction. So he's not supposed to move without the prophet's instruction. So keep that in mind as we read this text. So he's not supposed to move without the prophet's instructions, not on behalf of the prophet. Now, he can move in his own way, in his own self, on behalf of himself, but he cannot move as saying he's moving at the direction of the prophet without the instructions from the prophet, right? Because they're coming from God. So so this is where he goes astray. So what we, we studied yesterday about the healing of Naaman, and we see that Naaman was so prideful. We talked about that yesterday and how the instructions from Elijah told him to go dip in the Jordan seven times. And so he had to humble himself. He had to humble himself by listening to the young servant girl who said there's a prophet that if you go see him, you would be healed. And then he had to listen to his his men that were under him in rank. If you, if you would just listen to the instructions from the man of God, even though they're not complicated, they're simple. If you just follow them, you would be healed. And so he humbled himself, naming the commander of the army. And so he was healed. And so that's that's where we ended yesterday. So now we find ourselves with these same characters um, in this story as it continues in verse 20. But it begins with, but Gehazi, the servant of Elijah, the man of God said to himself. Now hold it right there. Gehazi said to himself, right? Text says he's a man of God. He says to himself. My master should not have let this Armenian get away without accepting any of his gifts. So remember, Naaman was so happy, so grateful to be healed that he tried to give Elijah so much gold and silver and clothes. And Elijah said, no, thank you. I don't want it. I don't want anything. God bless you. You know, keep going. So he didn't take it. 
So this is where we, we find ourselves. So now Gehazi is saying to himself, himself. So he's thinking. And now he's talking to himself. Oh, man. That was a lot of gold. I think yesterday I said it was about 650000 something like that, in, in current times and money just in gold. And I think it was like forty or 50000 in silver, not even counting the garments of clothes. So he probably kept looking at it and thinking about it. Ooh, that was a lot of gold. I probably could buy a lot with that. You know, I'm just Elijah's armor bearer. I'm his servant. You know, I, I'm his assistant. I'm his aide. I, I might need to carve out something for myself here. I don't know what he was thinking. But whatever he was thinking in his mind led him down the wrong path. See, his character, our character is made up of how we feel, right? How we think, and it's going to cause us to act in certain ways. And so whatever we constantly think about and we spend time pondering on, we start imagining it right and then we continue down that path we're going to do it so if we continue in a thought pattern that's not good it doesn't take long to get off the road don't take long to go left it doesn't take long so when something comes in our mind that we know is not of god see you can't stop a suggestion from coming to you oh you you should steal that that's basically what he was saying but you might not be able to stop a thought from coming in your mind, but that's why the word says cast down all thoughts and imagination that exalt themselves against the power, right, and the word of God. So we have to cast it down. How do we do that with the word of God? Oh, no, my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. I don't have to steal nothing. My God, my God has a, a, all the cattle on a thousand hills. I, You know, he supplies my needs. You know, I, I'm good. And so whatever he was thinking about he kept thinking about it and then he he crafted a plan to get it and so this is where we find ourselves and it says my master should not have let this armenian get away without accepting any of his gifts so not only did he think negatively and think covetousness about these gifts he second guessed the man of god he second guessed him because he said he shouldn't have done that. He should not have let him get away without getting any of his stuff. So not only did he start thinking evil, he started, you know, challenging the, the, the ways of the man of God. Now he's seen, right, Elijah perform miracles. He's seen him, you know, um, lay hands on it and put his body on the Shudamite woman's son and that he was revived. He saw, he, he threw the flower in the pot of poison stew and, and that it was made clean. And he saw, and, and he was right next to the man of God, just like Judas was right up next to Jesus, right? And so even though he was right up next to the man of God and he, he saw all these things, it was something still in his heart. That he said the man of God shouldn't have done that. So so he's going to make, he thinks, a correction. But not a correction that he thinks is going to bless Elijah. He's trying to make a correction to bless himself. So he says, now listen to this. He says, as surely as the Lord lives, I will chase after him and get something from him. Now wait a minute. So he's going to sit here and proclaim the name of God and say, as surely as God lives. So that's just like me saying, Jesus is the most high God. I'm going to go help myself to everything I see over there, even though it doesn't have my name on it. Bless God. You know, I, I think he meant for me to get it. No, no. If he meant for you to get it right, you don't have to sneak and hide and cheat and steal alive. He wants you to have it right No. So he says, as surely as the Lord lives, I will chase after him and get something from him. How, how many of you know that when God has something for you, you don't have to chase it? When God has a person for you, when he has a thing for you, when he has an anointing for you, when he has something for you, you, you don't have to chase it in that way. And so it's something amiss here. 
because he's chasing after something that's not for him, that doesn't belong to him, that doesn't have his name on it. That, that's why he has to chase it. Because when things are meant for us, I'm not telling you they're going to be easy, but I'm telling you they're going to be accessible to you. And you're not going to have to do something wrong to get something that God wants you to have. Now, that's the truth. So, verse 21. So, Gehazi sets off after Naaman. So he chases after him. Now watch this. When Naaman saw Gehazi running after him, he climbed down from his chariot to meet him. Now this is the same Naaman that we seen that was pretty prideful just, just a couple verses ago, right? He, he was the same one that said in um, verse chapter, still in chapter five and verse 11, Naaman says he became angry. And he stalked away. I thought, you know, certainly Naaman would come out to meet me. I expected him to wave his hand over the leprosy and call on the name of his God and heal me. Now, this is the same prideful man that was angry because Elijah sent Gehazi out with a message and didn't come out to meet him. And so now we see a different, we see a different Naaman because Naaman sees not Elijah running after him. He sees Elijah's servant and stops. Not only did he stop, he stopped and got out, dismounted and got out and waited for him. And he climbed down from his chariot and went to meet him. He didn't wait for him to come. He extended himself to go meet him. So we see a changed man here, right? So... Now I'm in verse 22. Well, the, the end of verse 21. Is everything all right, Naaman asked. Verse 22. Yes, Gehazi said. Now watch this. But my master has sent me to tell you. So not only did he go there to try to get the stuff that belonged to Elijah, that Elijah refused, and so now it belongs back to Naaman and the king. Well, he tells a lie on Elijah and says, but my master has sent me. So if, if someone in ministry has an assistant, they have an adjutant, they, they, they have an armor bearer, right? They have somebody that travels with them and, and most people do. You have to rely on that person's character and integrity because in, in a lot of ways they represent you. They're going to, you're going to interact with people through them because you can't interact with everybody. So you're going to interact with people through them. They're going to do transactions on your behalf. Matter, they're going to count your money for you. They're, they're going to do all kinds of things. So this was really a prestigious and honorable position. But what we see here is he twists it and tries to use it for his own gain. So he lies and says that, Elijah was the one who sent him. And he sent me to tell you that two young prophets from the hill country of Ephraim had just arrived. He would like the prophets from hill country to have something. That's basically what he's saying. He said these people came and Elijah now wants to give them a gift. So he sent me here. But we know that's not true. But my master has sent me to tell you the two young prophets from the hill country of Ephraim have just arrived. He would like. So he goes on to, to give his grocery list, to give his list at the bank that he wants to withdraw from somebody else's account. So he says 75 pounds of silver, two sets of clothes to each of them. I mean, he got his list like out, right? So he didn't thought about this. This wasn't something off the cuff. He, he thought about this as he was traveling and chasing after them. So he gives them his list. Verse 23, by all means, Naaman says, take twice as much. He was so grateful to be healed, so humble. He said, take twice as much, right? Take twice as much silver. Naaman insisted. He gave him two sets of clothes, tied up the money in two bags, and sent two of his servants with the gifts, right, for Gehazi. But when, verse 24, but when they arrived at the citadel, Gehazi took the gifts from the servants and sent the men back. 
Then he went and hid the gifts inside his house. And so we already know, I don't have to tell you, anytime we got to hide something, we already know it's something wrong, <laughs> right? If we have to hide things like that, I'm going to pretend I didn't get it. I, I, mm -mm. We already know it's something wrong. And so he told a lie. He was deceived, right? He was deceived by his own thoughts. And so that's something that we has great consequences sometime, and we're going to see that in this text. And so verse 25, when he went into his master's house, Elijah, Elijah asked him, where have you been Gehazi? Where you been? Right. That's like when you, with your parents, you go outside and you do something, you know, you're not supposed to, you come in the house, probably looking guilty. And they say, where you been? What you been up to? And, you know, you got to get that deer in the headlights look like I've been caught, right? <laughs> Let me try to figure out a lie. Let me try to get out of this. I'm in a jam now. Instead of me just confessing I've been caught red-handed, he, you know, complicates the matter by lying. So, he says, I haven't been anywhere, he replied. Verse 26, but Elijah asked him, Ooh, now this is so powerful. Don't you realize, he says, that I was there in spirit when Naaman stepped down from his chariot to meet you. Wow. Ooh, Lord, Jesus Christ. See, people don't realize that the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. You can't, you can lie, but you can't lie and get over on the Holy Spirit. See, Gehazi was deceived, but he wasn't going to deceive Elijah. See, just because Gehazi got deceived, right, by the enemy, he got tricked by his own, right, greed and covetousness. He was deceived, but Elijah wasn't deceived. He said, don't you realize that I was there in the spirit when I saw Naaman stepped down from the chariot to meet you. I asked you where you been because I already knew. That's like your parents said, did you eat those cookies you like? Right? Because they already know, right? He already knew. And so he wasn't even asking him. The text says he asked him, but it was really a statement, right? Don't you realize that I was there, right? I was there in spirit. When you stepped down, when you went to meet him, I was there. It, it, this is it's interesting. People don't realize that the Holy Spirit will tell you things. I mean, if you're watching me, you realize the Holy Spirit will tell you things. I'm not the only one the Holy Spirit speaks to. You know, God has 10,000 prophets, you know, never bowed a knee to bell. I ain't the only one. But I'm telling you, when God wants you to know something, he'll tell you. He sure will. I don't care how people try to lie to you. I don't care how they try to deceive you. When the Holy Spirit wants you to know something, he will make it known. We don't have to try to search around for people. We don't have to try to follow nobody and hide out in the bushes and look and see what they're doing. Mm -mm. No, if I think something is not right, I ask God. I sure do. I said, Lord, now I don't know. This don't sound right to me. I need you to tell me what's going on here because something is not right, you know. And so we all sort of have that feeling like something is not quite right here, you know. And I would encourage you to ask God to show you when something is amiss because when you already feel it, he's already telling you something is off. Something's missed the mark. Somebody's lying. Something is not quite right. I remember one time I was just, I don't even remember where I was. I, I, this was years ago too. And all of a sudden I heard a conversation, an entire conversation. It was like I was there in their house. And it's some friends of mine that I had. And it was like I was there. I heard her mother's voice. I heard my friend's voice. And I heard her sister's voice. And it was the three of them having a conversation talking about me. And I heard every word, every voice distinctively like I was there. <laughs> and it was a trip because 
I just was like, okay, God, you want me to really know how they feel about me. I don't need them to tell me how they feel about me because you let me hear it. I, I, it was like I was standing there listening to every single thing they said. But it was only because the spirit of truth wanted me to know. Right. So when God wants you to know something, you don't have to be searching all around. You know, if he tells you to go look it up, look on the Internet, there's a lot of information there, whatever it is. He'll show you the way to gather it, but it's not going to be some illegal way or some immoral way. Right. But the spirit of truth. That's why I, I really um, always say to people. Spend time in prayer, spend time with God. We don't have to so much worry about what people are doing, what they are doing, what they aren't doing. And that's right. He always prepares us. And if this person is trying to do this to me or, or this and all that kind of stuff. Yes, we should be mindful and we should be, you know, attentive. But but more than anything, we should be in tune with the Holy Spirit, not just so the Holy Spirit can tell us things, but so we can walk according to the will of God, because there's no other way to do that. Right. And other than to be in alignment with the Holy Spirit, there's there's no other way to do that. We need the word and we need the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us into all truth. Right. And so our thoughts. Right. They they. They make us act a certain way. And so whatever we think on, that's why it says, think on these things in the word of God, things that are pure, honest, just, lovely, of good report, deserving of praise, right? So when we meditate on the goodness of the Lord, we meditate on the word of God. We meditate on things that are good, honest, just, lovely, right? We meditate on good things because if, even in the natural, if you find yourself thinking about something somebody did to you over and over, you're going to get angry. Your body is going to tense up when you see them. You go, you know, even if you don't hit them or or lash out at them verbally, you're still going to be tight. Your body's going to because you've been sort of sort of marinating in that. And so whatever we we think we're, we're going to have these feelings are going to develop around it. And eventually we will act. We'll lash out at them in some way. And so we have to be careful, right, what we allow ourselves to think on, not just that a thought comes, but I'm saying when it's over and over and it's repeating and repeating and I keep thinking about it, mm -mm. cast it down in the name of Jesus. I love everybody. Everybody loves me. The word of God has been shed abroad in my heart by the Holy Spirit. Lord, help me to love my enemies. Help me to pray for them. You know, whatever it is, get that word out and put it to work. So back to our text, 26, Elijah, but don't you realize that I was there in spirit when Naaman stepped down from the chariot to meet you? Is this the time to receive money and clothes, olive groves and vineyards, sheep and cattle and male and female servants? So he didn't say that anything was wrong with the gifts. It wasn't the time, was not the time. And so um, Gehazi was out of order. First, we already know he lied and all that, but he's telling him it's, it wasn't the time. It's not even the time for us to be doing this. And so he didn't tell him you was never going to have it, but he tried to get something in a wrong way and out of season. And so it's not a blessing to receive something out of season or to try to get something that belongs to someone else. That really is the very definition of covetousness, wrong, right? Wrong motives, right? And so we don't want to have that, but we all, our character is going to be challenged. Every one of us. Don't think I haven't been presented with opportunities to do all kind of things that are wrong. People still will present you. I don't care how long you've been saved. They won't do it as often. But every now and then, somebody will present you with something that you'd be like, how come they called me with this? You know, what in the world is it? You know, but we have to be discerning enough because sometimes the enemy just, you throw everything on against the wall and see what sticks. Whatever they'll fall for, just put all the, the lines in the ocean and see who bites. You know what I mean? And so we, we just have to be discerning enough and, and, and connected enough and built up enough that we don't fall in these traps. And even if you do repent, ask God to forgive you, move on. But 
as in Gehazi, and the same thing with us. Yes, we should always repent when we've done something wrong. I, I repent all the time because sometimes I don't even know I may have omitted to do something, forgot to do something, or I didn't do it or didn't do it in a timely manner. Because when the Holy Spirit is telling you to do it, he sometimes have a time, you know, and so it doesn't mean whenever I feel like it, right? If I know that it, he wants me to do it now, I need to do it now and to not do it now, right? It's disobedience. So what happens to Gehazi? Now, let's see. It says in verse 27, because you have done this, you and your descendants will suffer from Naaman's leprosy forever, when Gehazi left the room, he was covered with leprosy and his skin was white as snow. So the disease that left Naaman was now upon Gehazi, but not only upon Gehazi, but upon his future offspring forever, which is quite tragic. Um, thank God for Jesus. Um, for we know that if... I was to go out and steal something. I probably would get caught. Thank God I've never done it. I probably would probably be obvious. But even if I asked for repentance, right, I would still have to suffer some kind of consequence. It, it probably wouldn't be leprosy, but I might have to go to jail or maybe I'd have to pay a fine or maybe this would be on my record. I don't know. But there's, you know, I often tell people that, yes, you always should ask for forgiveness but that does not mean that there won't be a consequence see people get that confused is that when we ask for forgiveness right we we think that that sort of wipes away all the consequences and it doesn't right you know we remember that with David and and so many other people in the Bible like you yes he asked for forgiveness after he you know um, put you know the ladies um, husband at the front of the line and, and he got killed but he was still responsible for that death and then the baby died and so there's consequences right to things that we do and yes God forgives us but that doesn't mean that that wasn't somebody else's stuff you took right and, and, it, and it still has some kind of consequence to it and so when when we do things that are not of God we yes get forgiven absolutely when we ask God but it doesn't mean right that we should all of a sudden be just you know wiped clean and so i say that because it's the truth people people often say well i feel like i'm being punished or i feel like i'm being persecuted well no you know persecution is when you haven't done anything and you're representative of the gospel and people mistreat you because of that that's different you know, a consequence is, is sort of a, a re chain reaction, right, from something that we did. All of us do things wrong, right? And so sometimes, you know, we, we sometimes forget that for every action, there's a reaction. So we can choose the action, but we can't choose the reaction, right? And so sometimes we're like, oh, I didn't think that was going to happen. It, I wouldn't have done it. I, it's not worth it. Well, hindsight's twenty twenty, right? And so there's a lot of things. I wouldn't have ate all those cupcakes and sat on the couch if I'd have known I was going to gain 30 pounds. I'm just saying, you know, <laughs> that's the truth. I don't be saying, you know, thinking about that later that I'm not going to be able to fit in my clothes if I'm, you know what I'm saying? That I'm talking about me. I ain't talking about none of y'all. I'm just talking about me. I'm not always thinking about the consequences later. But there's little, big, everything has, right? Everything. So, and it is, yeah, it's funny, but at, you're right. At the same time, there's always, you know, it's choices, right? It's choices. So how we feel, what we think is going to cause us to act in certain ways, and that's our character. Our character is what we will be known by. It is how people know us. It is the way that, that sort of we, we have this way to figure out whether we're going to interact with people or not. We look at their character. We, we, how do they present themselves? How do they act with other people? What's their temperament? You know, let me see their past record. That's the reason there's credit reports and you know, police reports, because people want to see how you acted before, right? Seriously, <laughs> they want to see, did you pay the last person? I don't know. Let me see before I give you some money, right? Before I give you a loan, let me see if you did before. 
And so let me see if I let you live in my apartment. Let me see if you got evicted last time. You know, and so even in the natural, right, there's consequences when we do stuff. Yeah, we get forgiven, but it's still on your credit report. You get forgiven, but it's still, you know, a report out there with your name on it. Even if it's not in the natural, it is in, in heaven, right? We still know that, you know, some some things we do. So on tonight, I'm so glad that you were with me on tonight. This was sort of the second half of our um, Second Kings chapter 5. Gehazi was deceived, but Elijah was not. The sad thing for me about this text is I feel like Gehazi was in a really privileged position. There's not, we don't hear about him sort of before Second Kings, and we don't hear about him after. I think it's only one more really story about him. I think in the eighth chapter, we'll get there because we're going to keep going through Second Kings, but he's not mentioned too much after that. And I feel like when you are somebody as as anointed as Elijah's assistant, he could have, you know, easily been pouring into him like Elijah did Elisha. It, it could have been some kind of different relationship had Gehazi's heart been different, right? The money will come. It, it will come. You see that Elijah's anointing was so strong. He was turning down things. Shoot him like, woman, let me build a house. He's like, no, let me give you this. Let me give you that. Let me do this for you, man of God. Let, let, me, let me do that. And he's steady saying, oh, feed the people first. Give to them first. It's not the time to get no clothes and gold. Come on, let's do this. Let, let's take care of business, right? He didn't say that it was wrong. To have money he said it's not the time for money and clothes and servants and all that you know it, it's a time for those things but this is the time that we're set aside to do this work not for anything else and so sometimes we we want to get ahead of god and we, and we want the things the possessions and that's what threw him off is he wanted he was covetousness he wanted the stuff i didn't see him seek the anointing i didn't see it I didn't see him seek the anointing as much as he sat up under Elijah. We remember him earlier in the text, he loaves to Elijah. And then he says, give it to the people. And the servant says, which has to be Gehazi, there's only one mentioned in the text, says, this isn't, this isn't enough to feed all these people. You know, so instead of him you know, we don't we don't really see him sort of seeking that same anointing. Now he's seen him multiply, he's seen him be blessed, he's seen him in all these ways, but we don't see him, we don't see Gehazi seeking the anointing. He's seeking something else. And so he was seeking money and things, and that ultimately ended in his destruction. Not only him, it, it sort of tainted his family line with this curse of white skin or or leprosy, leprous. I shouldn't say white skin, leprous um, skin. And so he should have been loyal to God and loyal to the man of God, but he was more interested in lying in his pockets, so to speak. And so we see today too, um, it, it's, it's the same traps the enemy has for people today. It's the trap of greed, pride, right? Sex, money, drugs, you know, it's all of the same kind of lustful things the enemy throws our way. You don't have to be famous to be presented with those options, right? The enemy always tries to present us with those same options. <laughs> that's right. That's right. People close. That's right. You all said, yeah, it, 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 it really, Miss Martha, absolutely. People really close often miss the anointing. That's how you see sometimes with pastors, kids, and they really struggle with with sometimes being under that kind of anointing and really struggle to find themselves. And maybe Gehazi was struggling being in Elijah's shadow. I don't know. It had to probably be a little challenging to be, you know, in his shadow, such a powerful man of God. He might have struggled with that role. You know, you never know. Some people have a hard time, you know, not being, you know, the recognized one and being in somebody else's shadow. And, and, and he might have, you know, who knows, the Bible doesn't say he might have struggled in that way. But we know he, he obviously had some internal demons, right, that he was wrestling with. So, so God bless you all. I'm so glad you joined me on tonight. That's all I have for you.